Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Andrew Henley. And uh, um, hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Henley. And um, I am the president and founder of Pleasant Hill Historians. Um, I was actually requested to do this video uh, tonight by a few of my friends. And so I hope they're joining me. If they're not, um, they will be shortly. Um, and so today we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about tracing your house and its roots. Now this can be, um, this can be anything from the property owners of the original house to possibly even the, um, the owners of the land. And so I was originally a house that my family had owned. However, I wanted to really dive more deeply into the house that um, a friend of mine is actually uh, selling. So let me go ahead and I'll uh, introduce myself again. If you've joined us another week, thank you. Welcome back. Um, I, I do these every week at six o'clock on Friday, but I received my bachelor's at uh, Westminster College, um, which is located in Western Pennsylvania, beautiful campus. Um, I received my bachelor's in history, and then I'm working currently on my master's um, at the University of Pittsburgh, where I really think uh, um, data uh, and history can really partner together, but data in general, our lives surround um, data. But I, I founded this company, Pleasant Hill Historians, because everyone asks me to help them. So why not just provide them the resources so that they can help themselves? But also I am here for them. So I wanted to make sure that I, I do some instruction along the way. So um, I am an amateur genealogist. I think I said I've done it for about 12 years, maybe 15 years now. I did start young, so I don't, um, I am only 25. However, at the same time, um, I really found my interest at a young age. But I dedicate my life to history and to education. I'm on the board at the Lawrence County Historical Society, where I've been there uh, since 2008. But um, we, um, I do a Civil War series for fifth and sixth graders. And uh, I also designed some information panels. And so these are just two examples of those panels that I've designed. Um, today, we're going to dive a little more deep into a house that I was actually, um, I was actually introduced to by a friend of mine, Karen Coulter, who I met at Westminster. Uh, and she is now a real estate agent. Um, and so I thought this would be a perfect time to really discuss uh, houses and help her because a lot of things that are happening in this world with the pandemic, um, why not do something else to help somebody else? So our goals tonight um, are to um, learn about how to trace your property's history, find out about the stories of these owners, trace some of the lineage of your home's ownership, connect with the previous owners, and then learn about the resources which are available. So I have for you this evening a nice introductory video. And I thought it'd be nice to show, showcase this. Hi, Beverly. Hi, Ben. Thank you for joining. And hi, Kathy. So um, go ahead, sit back and watch this video. It's about one minute. I went ahead. I just did it this week. So I promise you I was...
So that was a quick video of the site that we're going to be um, really looking at today. Uh, and if you all recognized it, um, it is 3066 Main Street in West Middlesex. Uh, this was the house that Karen uh, Coulter introduced me to. Um, and so with a beautiful house, um, I, I was shocked whenever I came up to it and when she shared it. And so I really wanted to dive into this, help her out. Um, she has a buyer, which is awesome. Um, and what an amazing property to uh, really um, acquire. And so let's uh, dive a little more deep into this ownership of this house. And so um, let's locate it, where to start. So that blue dot is me on the left hand side, but then right above it, that red piece that is 3066. Um, and this is going to be in West Middlesex. Um, there it is right there on the corner. It's on the corner of, um, well, it's on Main Street there in West Middlesex as you're entering into the, the borough. And then um, I, I looked at the first resource that we can go to. Um, property ownership is a um, public knowledge. Uh, so I looked at the Mercer County Tax Parcel Viewer. You can do this by going to your, your county and then typing in ArcGIS Parcel Viewer or something similar to that. And I found the owner as, um, I first read it as the Marketing LLC, but then realized it's THG LLC. Um, and so I had trouble finding the deed that, uh, that we're going to eventually preview, but this is uh, some information about the house itself. So on the right hand side, 6-26-2018, was the sale date and I used this information to find out more about um, the property itself. So I now know the ownership. They purchased it 626 uh, 2018 THG Marketing LLC and they uh, currently had owned it. Um, and then um, the recorder of deeds is here and uh, I'm sorry I'm just having some technical difficulties give me one second Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and continue. I hope that everyone is still with us. Um, but the recorder of deeds is actually a uh, um, a website that uh, is available to the public. Each county has a recorder of deeds. This is where you go to uh, find the information about um, the 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 deed or property in which you are researching and to dive a little more deeply into that. Um, and so I did provide some links there, but a lot of this is accessible um, via, uh, via some research about your, your county and then to dive a little more into your, your specific um, county's re recorder of deeds. And so the first deed uh, that we have is the Mark THG Marketing LLC, and this is in um, this is the deed that um, you are able to find, and so it's from the Federal National Mortgage Association to THG on June eighteenth, twenty eighteen. And I hope that everyone is still connected. I know that there's been some complications with this. So um, as I continue, um, 
um, the what you can find here on the bottom half of it is that this area known as 3066 Main Street um, in Pennsylvania um, it does have a prior deed recorded September 28th um, 2017 and then as we continue um, I do have that as a known ownership and um, and then you have the THG right after that. And then I took that information and then I was able to go into um, it a little further and find the previous owner. Um, and it does look as though it's a, it was a foreclosure that had happened. And um, it looks as though uh, it was from a Hope Ann Lovin, uh, Lovrenoff Moran and her late husband, William P. Moran, to um, the foreclosure company listed here. Um, and this dated, um, was dated in 20, um, 20, excuse me, 2017. And it lists on the very bottom, the previous deed, which had it as uh, Hope Ann Lovinoff and, um, William Moran as both single and then they eventually put it together into their um, marriage. And so then this is the deed that explains that information a little further. Um, and what's nice about it is that in the deeds it does typically list previous ownerships. And so as you see on the very bottom here, the same property which Diane Morava and Richard Faree Jr wife and husband granted to and conveyed to William P. Moran and Hope Ann Lovinoff, um, both of them listed as single. Um, what's interesting about this is that you, you then have that information about that previous deed um, th that is being referenced. And so this deed does show it as February 20, um, 2004. And then the next piece is um, your uh, your new ownership of what you what you have found. And then I was able to dive back from Diane Morava and Richard Faree, um, and it does show that there was a uh, it's the same ownership listed as Joseph Trey and Deborah Trey um, to Diane Morava and Richard Faree. Um, it was recorded in uh, that book and that number. And so I, I was using the same search engine. This is from the county um, in Mercer County. And then I was able to find some more information with respect to that, diving deeper into it through the deeds. So now I, you can see that there's a Joseph Trey and a um, Richard Faree listed there or excuse me, Joseph Trey, Deborah Trey, and then Diane Morava and Richard Furry. Um, diving back from that, then I have a Michael Lutheran and Karen Lutheran listed as being previous owners once again. And so as I uh, continue to dive into this a little further, I see that Michael and Lut Karen Lutheran are there selling it 97. Um, and then I go back further um, and I find that um, there was a deed that preceded this Mary Jean Lewis as a widow. Um, and this was recorded July 23rd, 1992. Let me hit pause. I know I just went through a lot of these um, different deeds, but this is a very interesting piece. I was actually able to connect with Mary Jean Lewis's daughter. Um, and Molly, I think that you're on this uh, today. And, um, you know, I, what I find interesting is that all of these stories that she was sharing with me about this house. And so um, hearing, I was almost on the phone with, an, with her for about an hour. And um, not only that, but mm -hmm. um, the current owner, I was also able to speak with um, Chris Horn. And so I think that that is um, what really brings this house to life. Um, and so Molly's conversations about a wedding that had happened in the house or an anniversary that had happened in the house, 
as well as the um, she had commented about the video about the dogwoods in bloom. Um, um, and as we'll find out through this deed here, um, Gerald T. Lewis, which was Molly's father, um, and Mary Jean Lewis, um, and which was her mother, um, they had purchased it from a Chester So Byers and Edna Byers um, in 1964. That means that, um, I'll go into this real soon, but that means that that family had lived there from 1964 until 1992. And uh, I would say that there's a great amount of information that um, you could glean from these previous owners that had lived um, throughout the house um, for some, sometimes the longest period. If you see that, they're the longest tenants. But within the previous deed, which I was referencing, um, Michael Lutheran and Karen Lutheran requested a survey to be done. And what's nice about this is now it does show the house listed as 432 East Main. Um, and the reason being is that 3066 was after um, all of the house numbers were changed after 9-11. And so this is the previous ownership, um, the previous house number, uh, 432. And it does show a two-story frame structure, but north of it shows NF, which is now or formerly the Vassen family, and then shows just north of that, now or formerly the Garrett family, and on the left-hand side, United Presbyterian Church. It's on the corner of Haywood Street and East Main Street. And so this is a really, really interesting piece, and actually all of those structures, I believe, are still there. Um, and But this outlines the house itself. And so um, these are the owners that I have found so far dating to the cell in 1964 to the Lewis family from the Byers family. Um, and then I, I reached a dead end. And the reason being is that a lot of this information is not available online previous to a certain date. And so as we know, we are uh, sometimes at a loss for digital files just because, I mean, it's great, grateful that a lot of these files are digitized, are available online, but now we have to go to the physical site and we know exactly what book and what deed we're looking for. We're looking for um, the deed that So Buyers re, um, had sold it to Mary Jean and Gerald T. Lewis on June, June 1st, oh, June 2nd, sorry, June 2nd, 1964. And uh, then we'll need to go to the courthouse for that information, which should list the previous owners. However, I was antsy, so I wanted to look at other areas to find this information. So um, what through my knowledge of working at the Historical Society, I have found that directories are a great asset. However, West Middlesex is a borough, not a city. Um, so the challenge is, is that not all director, directories exist for boroughs. And so um, luckily it did have it listed here as West Middlesex having a directory in 1940. And I was able to find a um, Margaret B. Johnson, widow of William W. Johnson of W. W. Johnson Insurance Agency, um, and their, uh, their office was at 100 Main Street, but her house was at 432 Main Street. So I was able to find this Margaret Johnson as a owner and occupant of the house in 1940. And if you look down on the second line, you'll see that W.W. Johnson Insurance Agency and then in parentheses shows Mrs. Margaret B. Johnson and C. So Byers. And if you remember, that was So Byers, which was listed here as selling the house in 1964. And so there could have been a transfer of property either from her estate if they didn't have children or um, they could have, she could have left it to her partner in business. 
Um, I don't know what those stories are until I have the actual deeds to go off of. And so as I was um, going through it, I wanted to double check this. And so I found the 1940 census, which is available online. Um, and this 1940 census uh, does show a Margaret Johnson living at 432. Um, the value of the house is $300. Um, and then it does show her as a widow. Um, and then it also shows a 432, a Leroy Clark and Hazel Clark. And what's interesting is Molly had informed me after I went through this with her that Leroy and Hazel, uh, Leroy went by uh, Robert, I believe is what she had said. But um, these were tenants within the house because the house is so big that it made sense that this was uh, a tenant. So then I knew uh, Margaret Johnson lived in the house in uh, 1940. And so then as I go through, I am able to um, dive a little more deeply into it. So 1930, I just figured, let me go back a, a decade and see if Margaret is listed in the 1930 uh, directory. However, in 1930, um, it didn't show on Ancestry, If let me go back, it didn't show on Ancestry that West Middlesex had a directory. So uh, sometimes directories listed boroughs, neighboring um, areas, uh, as well as um, maybe rural communities. And so what I was able to do is go into the Sharon City Directory. Sharon is a neighboring town to West Middlesex, a city actually. Uh, West Middlesex is only a borough. So then I found in the 1930 Sharon City Directory in the back an, a listing of residents within West Middlesex, listing Margaret B. Johnson, a widow of William Johnson and of the W.W. W. Johnson Insurance Agency, her house being at the corner of Main Street and Cemetery Street. Now, if you remember correctly, the house was at the corner of Haywood and Main Street. So I, I doubted that at first, but then I realized that there was a church next door. And in the subsequent maps that I'll show you, it did have a cemetery right behind it. And so um, as I go through this, I wanted to look her up in the 1930 census, which verified that she was at uh, or that to verify that she was at the same residence, but here I have a Margaret Johnson, the house prop, the property valued at $3,000, which was the same value of the 1940 census. And then, um, she is listed here. This is the same person because she was 68 in the 1940. She's 57 in the 1930. Um, and I was able to, to kind of find out. It does say Margaret Johnston, but that's just a phonetic error that census takers typically sometimes made. Um, but I believe that to be her. And then um, uh, for two decades, she was listed as a widow. She was listed as a widow on this directory, and she was listed as a widow on this directory. And so I questioned who was William W. Johnson, what happened to him? So I found out that William W. Johnson, um, I, I was able to pull the death certificate as well from Ancestry. Ancestry has digitized death certificates from Pennsylvania 1906-1967. Um, and in this death certificate does have a William W. Johnson dying of prostate cancer in um, December 27th, 1929, two days after Christmas. Um, it does have him dying at the residence in 1929, um, and the informant, or who had called and been there, um, was his wife. And so it shows him being born in 1868 and um, marrying Margaret Johnson. Um, he was 61 years old, 8 months and 21 days. So this is a really interesting component. Um, now, um, 
another piece, I, I couldn't find anything after this, 1929. So then um, I went ahead uh, another interesting piece that we have at the Historical Society that I've used before are the Sanborn fire maps. Sanborn was a fire insurance company that created maps to really lo locate some of these houses, um, whether they were wood or stone frame. As you can see here, each of the different shades of colors um, determine what kind of materials were used in the construction of the building. And so here you have yellow for wood frame structures, pink for stone or brick frames or brick structures. But if you see the yellow dot in the middle of the church, um, that is wood. And so then you can, see, the reason being is that if they were larger structures, they would know um, where wood was. Um, I know in Newcastle here, we have the Scottish Rite Cathedral, the only thing that would burn is the stage. Everything else um, um, would have been non-flammable, um, except for the furniture, of course, but as far as the structure. So 1921, December 1921, we have the house on the corner of Main Street and then this perpendicular street here. We have a manse to the left of it, First Presbyterian to the left of that. We have an old Presbyterian cemetery behind it, cemetery. So then I thought, well, maybe that was Cemetery Street to the right of it as well. And then we have those two houses behind it. Um, 1920, um, I went ahead and pulled the 1920 census, and it did show Margaret married to William and living with his father, Jacob M. Johnson. It does say they live on Main Street. However, it doesn't really say that they lived in that house. Um, I can't determine whether or not that that is the case. And so as I go through this, um, I would have to have the records to substantiate it through the deeds, which are available as long as um, the, um, I, Molly had told me that the courthouse in Mercer had burned. And so there could be a, a lack of records for that unfortunate instance, but we can really go back and try to find that deed to see if they were living there at the time in 1920, and they go back from there. So um, this this would be uh, a possible dead end in 1920. I don't can't say that that's for certain. So now I have Margaret Johnson, widow, um, lived there from 1930 to 1940, and probably before, probably after. But then they um, there was a transfer that happened either. Um, between Margaret Johnson and another person, and then to Chester So Byers, or um, it could have um, been directly from Margaret Johnson to Chester So Byers. And so then I see here uh, Mary Jean Lewis, and then it goes through all of those um, individuals that we have found so far. Um, and when I reach dead ends, especially on uh, deeds, what you can always do, um, this is the deed for the Lewis um, property from, um, from, from Lewis to Lutheran. So from Mary Jean and Gerald Lewis to Michael Lutheran and Karen Lutheran. It does showcase the bordering properties. So um, what's nice about this is you can actually investigate your neighbor's property to learn more about your property. And so it says here at Chester Bowles property, and then I pulled up that property, and um, unfortunately that item hadn't been digitized either, and so I couldn't find um, the record to reference whose adjacent property was on Chester Bowles property. And so I, uh, I reached a, a dead end <laughs> to a dead end. Um, however, um, I did find another Sanborn map dated 1900, which shows the property standing there um, to the right of the parsonage and to the right of the Presbyterian Church on the corner of now Main and Cemetery Street. So it does show that Cemetery Street was a street and was the predecessor preceding name of, um, of Haywood Street. And so then you can really um, deduce that that is the house that stood there. 
uh, and still was standing there in 1900. Now, the next map I have, 1850 was the next map that I found. This was at the Library of Congress. I put all my citations in there, tried to as much as I could. These Sanborn maps are available at Penn State University Digitize. The, this map was available at the Library of Congress, um, and it is the Hopkins map, which showcases the borough of Middlesex. Um, I think it was a village at the time, um, but I'd have to look at what it was, semantics. But it does show the houses, and it does show who the owners were. You can even look at it really closely. Um, some last names, Warren, Lewis, Stewart. Um, but then it does show, if you see there, the Presbyterian Church. However, out of picture, you, you don't have that house that we're looking for. Um, so I blew up the map on the, instead of looking at the smaller version of West Middlesex, or just Middlesex, it was determined to be West Middlesex later, because there was already a Middlesex, Pennsylvania, and so they just named it West Middlesex. Um, it was the, um, it, the name originated because it was between, it was on the canal between Newcastle and, um, and um, a northward city, I think it's Sharon, but I could be wrong. But you see there the black line that's running through the, the, the map on the left-hand side, that is actually the canal um, that was adjacent to the Shenango River. So um, you have outside of the city that dot um, just to, to the right below where it says F Glasgow. Um, we, I believe that to be the Presbyterian Church, and then this house would be just to the right of it. So it doesn't show on the 1850 map, um, but it does show in the 1900 Sanborn Fire map. So I've been able to say that it's between 1850 and 1900, which makes sense for the architecture of the house. Um, then what I found interesting was is that on this map on the right hand side, you see faint lines going northward, southward, eastward, westward. And um, you might think, oh, they're latitude, longitude lines. Well, going a little further, I bl blew out the map, and I saw that there were more, And so, um, but they didn't really line up as latitude and longitude. Some of them were off a little bit. Um, and then I realized that um, Western Pennsylvania was known for being a um, property given to soldiers as payment for their service in the Revolutionary War. And so I pulled up the um, 1906 Warranty Atlas, which listed all of the um, donation lands and who received each of these lands. And um, a lot of these donation lands, every property typically in Western Pennsylvania was a donation land as a form of payment for the Revolutionary War. The soldiers had the opportunity to sell the land and receive payment or to settle on them, as um, a lot of them had. And so you'll see here, a Captain Thomas Douglas received this portion of land. Um, and if I, lo I love looking at the, the boundary markers. It says a white oak, W oak, an ash tree, a sugar tree, um, or a, uh, a brown oak, or a black oak, B oak. Um, and so it has trees as boundary markers on the uh, property itself. And then um, I believe that to be the one that uh, the west eastern part of Middlesex, West Middlesex, would be consistent of. And so Captain Thomas Douglas now is the first owner of the property, dated October 28th, 1785. There's a gap, <laughs> large gap, between 1785 and 1930, which the house was built between 1850 and 1900. And a lot of this information um, is then turned physical. So we've done all the digital research that we could do. Um, Karen Coulter did share with me that there was commentary on um, one of her, uh, on the listing of the house that, um, that, showed um, who the house was built by. However, um, I would want some 
documentation to support it, um, it referenced a civil war individual. Um, and so I would, I would really want that documentation to substantiate it and then connect the dots between this gap, which currently exists. So um, I think that um, that's um, the summary of my research, but I did want to share. So Molly was the individual, the granddaughter, or the daughter of um, Mark, uh, of, you'll see here, of Mary Jean Lewis and Gerald Lewis. And she wrote a book about the house. And so this house is called um, Main, or this book is called Main Street. A Gables and Gingerbread Story. It's a historical fiction novel. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. I told Molly, I said, I'll sell the book for you. So you can buy it on Amazon. And uh, I think it'd be a really fascinating piece to just uh, learn more about the house and to dive deeper into that story. Um, and what an interesting connection that um, that we were able to find that every everything was coming around. Even the current owner is a Westminster grad. And so I thought it was very um, fascinating that um, I can go as far as to investigate a house that I knew nothing about, just to find out that the story was actually closer to me than I anticipated. And so as I go through this, um, what did we learn? We learned how to, um, well, I surprisingly was able to track down some descendants of the current, of previous owners. Um, I talked with the, I spoke with the current owner. Um, we were able to go through the recorder of deeds within the county um, to find out who the previous owners were. Um, we were able to find out what our next steps are, coming from more of a physical light. We were able to um, really look at what opportunities um, Ancestry.com has through directories as well as death certificates. We found out maps that were available, uh, the Sanborn maps at Penn State University. Those are these. And then the, um, the Hopkins maps, which are available at the Library of Congress. Um, and then we also found the uh, warranty township maps, which are available at PHMC or the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission. And uh, we were able to find all of those different owners. And yes, there are a lot that are missing <laughs> for a whole deck or for a whole century, but um, I'm surprised with what I was able to find digitally. And this could turn into a part two. Um, after uh, everything opens, my goal is to really dive into that. Um, but I, as I do with every um, piece, I, I like to showcase kind of who I've been working with, who I've been partnering on. Um, or partnering with, and uh, last week I showcased Sense of Connection, but this week I wanted to showcase the Human Services Center in Newcastle. They're currently working on a grant and they're looking for partners um, to help them uh, cover this 50-50, 50 percent um, coverage on the grant uh, for this project, and whether it's um, uh, supplies, services that you could um, assist with. They're looking for uh, assistance with this. So this is right on the Columbus Interbelt in West Washington Street in Newcastle. And it's going to be an ADA accessible boat launch and fishing pier. And to really utilize the Shenango River, which we were just talking about more up up north um, on West, in West Middlesex, but we're looking at this section of the Shenango River. And so on the left-hand side, it's the uh, Shenango Street State, or the, um, excuse me, I think Shenango Street Station, but the um, old train station there. Um, and I have a link to it as well. This website is really fascinating, lists all of the train stations that um, were in Lawrence County, in the Pennsylvania, Lawrence County. Um, but they're looking to develop this into a little nature area. And so I had offered my assistance with the, the kiosk at the trailhead. And so that's, um, but I wanted to say if anyone's in, interested in helping out with the project, contact Laura Glenn, Laura Glenn at the Human Services Center in Newcastle. And uh, sh uh, the grant is due next week. So please contact her as soon as possible uh, to see if you'd be able to assist in some way or some capacity. 
Um, so that's a little bit about that project that we're working with, um, I'm offering my assistance with. But um, I wanted to thank you. Thank you for joining me this week. I hope you found it interesting. Um, in the comments, I think Molly was there and uh, uh, maybe Chris was and Karen Coulter. I thank all of them for helping me with this research. Um, and I hope to see you next Friday at 6 o'clock. I try to do this every week. But, uh, our newest blog posted five days ago. Um, it was just a, a piece that I had written for a class, but it's interesting. It's about um, the international trial um, of the um, destruction of Timbuktu um, just within the uh, last two decades. And so uh, this was a trial in front of the International Criminal Court um, with, with respect to uh, crimes against humanity because he, um, he blew up a uh, mosque, uh, or not a mosque, a, a burial site of a, of a Muslim leader. And so I think that it's a really interesting precedent for the UNESCO to set. Um, check it out. You can go to www.phhist.com forward slash blog. Um, you can also view some of our previous workshops, which are available on YouTube, as well as um, um, learn more about uh, the company and what I've been doing. So I hope you all have enjoyed this. I hope you all have learned something. And I hope to see you again um, next week. Thank you all.